welcome to the Build Business Acumen podcast, where we deliver practical knowledge and powerful guidance. Here is your futuristic host, Nathaniel Schooler. I'd like to introduce Monique Morrow. Monique is a chief technology strategist, groundbreaking technologist, and a proven innovator. Monique is a former CTO at Cisco who has worked tirelessly to align technologies to society's needs. Monique is also the co-founder of the Humanized Internet. I've been thinking about AI for a few years and like most people, I was initially worried, but I think now I'm actually more excited about the possibilities of working less hours, which is hopefully something that we should be able to do in the near future. AI, as we know it, uh, what we hear uh, when we talk about the Industrial Revolution 4.0 or, or whatever you want to call it, is that anything that is repetitive, your uh, robots will take your jobs over. So we'll take over the job. And so there is this negative uh, narrative that comes out and says, for example, you're going to lose your jobs. But on the other hand, uh, and so, so you, you see that and you say, well, there will be new skills that are required, et cetera. But that narrative can go further into information technologists, you know, people who work in IT. Because technology is so fast, uh, you know, how fast are you thinking? Uh, how fast are we using our brain? Becomes a, a very, very interesting subject in itself. So AI for good, um, AI and ethics, I'm involved uh, with the IEEE AI for Action uh, group. I'm actually a co-chair of the Extended Reality Committee. Uh, we're looking at a narrative that uh, uh, discusses, it's very open uh, to people, you know, whether you're a roboticist or a filmmaker or uh, whatever it is you're doing, looking at how we uh, use these technologies um, that covers a gamut of privacy, uh, covers a gamut of, of policy to have a, a, a discussion in the industry about, um, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily be, dis- that is dystopian. AI could be used, uh, you know, you can have this tool that can be used to diagnose your own diseases. Uh, you can be, uh, it, you, you yourself be, can become the center of that com- Copernican re- uh, revolution, um, which is a good thing, which is a very positive thing. The other part of it is AI taking over jobs. I strongly believe that AI can be a uh, stimulate for, uh, stimulant, if you will, uh, for job creation. For example, w- one of the uh, narratives that we talk about in this book called The People-Centered Economy, the Ecosystem of Work, which is published in November of this past year, is could we imagine something that's nascent um, that you can create with the use of artificial intelligence uh, you know, a job as a, a nascent job as a service for you. So with inputs that you would provide, you would say, look, I want to work in this geography. I want to earn this amount of money or whatever. And I want to work with these types of people. You could use this technology to create some uh, feedback to you and say, hey, look, we have a job, the perfect job for you. And uh, it, of course, it involves an ecosystem of players, which includes private industry. It includes government also because they want to be be part of this. And who do you disintermediate? And by the way, you could pay a tax for that, or you pay something for that uh, service. And you could disintermediate, if you will, uh, the unemployment office. Because if you can guarantee somebody that you're opting in for, I kind of look at it as LinkedIn on steroids, if you will, but it's reverse. It's very, very interactive. You know, you would be provided for the job that's tailored for you. It's called a tailored job as a service. Right. So, sure. so what you're sort of saying is that this platform technology, AI powered technology will slot in with people's uh, personality traits, their current skills, their mindset, their motivations, the location they want to go to and the amount of money they want to earn. And then it will, and their past career history and experience. And then it will, and then it will go out and it will search for the jobs that would actually suit that individual and help them to upskill to get to that job. Is that what you're saying? It's very much in that direction. And it's what information you choose to share, by the way. I think that's really important. I want to work with these types of people, et cetera, because, you know, there is this, uh, you know, the thing of it is what's very, very important is the privacy issues. You don't want something that's held by a centralized platform, right? 
uh, I think uh, what you provide uh, can disappear, you know, when you think about that disappearance of data so that it's not just held by, uh, you know, you should be able to get an instantaneous feedback and then you could see that the data is has disappeared or something to that effect. Because we have to honor the privacy uh, uh, we know regulations and plus we don't, we are looking at that, this platform, we call it Jobly, if you look at it, Jobly, uh, doesn't hold data and that's very, very important for you. Now, you may, you, the thing, the thesis here is that uh, what you now have is something that is very interactive uh, to you, which is very new. Um, it's, uh, you can see where, what is disintermediating at the end of the day. The government gets involved because now there, there could be, in, you know, maybe you pay, uh, maybe that's a tax you pay for, right, as a service, we don't know. Uh, for example, in the Netherlands, you wouldn't be paying for that. It's part of what you, it's part of, you know, you wouldn't be paying for such a, a service. So, so it depends right. on how, because I think this gets into regulatory tech, uh, tech policy. Uh, and I think there you have this gets into the sort of the ecosystem of players that we have to have in this in this in this realm. So that thesis about using Jobly to create something for you, nascent job as a service, is something I think is is possible should be possible. We believe it should be possible uh, with technology, but there is also, and we also believe it shouldn't be a zero sum game. We should we believe that people, no matter your age, no matter who you are. Uh, when they are uh, when they opt in to to participate in Jobly, should be able to uh, you know uh, have something that's a nascent job for them, and uh, given the inputs that they have, so w we think that that's important uh, and it's a possibility. I first talked about this at the Jobly at the uh, Web uh, Summit in um, Portugal this past November. In fact, it was interesting. I was in a summit. I was on a panel with people from the EU, from the Macron government. I mean, from various governments. And because the EU has, by the way, a big vote this year, I think people were, were very intrigued. Because this is a Copernican revolution. It is about putting people in the center uh, and not having things happen to them, right? So that's, that's AI job creation. AI for good is also, so we talked about IEEE and what, what the recommendations are in that area. But AI for good also has, um, you know, there's also the, what we hear often is the dystopian, this polarity between, between gosh, m weapons of mass empowerment. You know, I gave you an example of, you know, being able to diagnose your cancer, self-diagnose, et cetera. To, yeah. We're not far off. If you think that the iWatch number four has already got an ECG machine yeah. on it, on your watch, I mean, that's... Well, and here's the thing that, that becomes interesting. If you, I, I would like to, um, I would like to disintermediate the way healthcare is done. And, you know, you have the NHS and, and the UK. I mean, the, th the thing of it is, is uh, I was given sort of a hypothetical. Could we imagine paying for health, uh, paying for insurance, healthcare insurance, a dollar a month? What would that look like? Is it possible? Why can't we have a moonshot like that? I mean, you put people on the moon, you right. had a moonshot. And the reason that you have to think about moonshots in this space is where, where technology could play or not, techno, uh, or not play is I believe we're still in the 19th century, especially when it comes to, you know, ageism. I think people, when Bismarck said, you know, on Bismarck, people should be retiring at age 50, 60, 65. I mean, people were barely living to 55. And so we have not come out of that. And we've come out with it uh, with prejudices and discrimination. And even in the healthcare system, that is, that is sort of uh, gamified I mean, it, against you. And so I think that right. we need to think about, if we're using technology, the watch examples you gave. If I'm a good citizen uh, and I'm, show, I'm sharing my data, selectively sharing my data with mm -hmm. an insurance provider or whatever. I expect my policy to go down. I want my policy oh, to go sure. down. I just, yeah. I, 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 and I don't want this feedback to say, well, we're sorry, that's government regulated. Well, think about, uh, you know, think about new, new paradigm shifts and in, in, in these discussions. So that's an example of, Hey, we could be monitoring our healthcare. We could see whether or not we're, uh, um, you know, open for, this gets into genomics, into targeted smart medicine, 
we could actually see or or um, experience whether or not we're we're going to be subjected to Parkinson's disease or dementia, uh, Alzheimer's, and so on. We should be able to see that and not only see it for it, but do something about it. That's the power of targeted medicine. And so this is the power of technology at its at its best, as be, at, at its best, especially when we're thinking about um, you know artificial intelligence you think about i uh think about watson's healthcare example uh by ibm so yeah. we we think that we know that that technology exists we now as citizens have to become you know part of that central we have to be central to that universe the other component of it however is that we have to have a governance model you know because the 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 then you have this polarity with this is mass empowerment i can take care of myself i can look at you know uh, how i can get a job as a service and all of this kind of wonderful stuff but uh, there is also the governance model is uh, mass destruction so and that is that that is that is you know it's a paranoia you know this gets into the singularity you know when robots take over you know with this this gets into the so, sort of thing about robots having uh, uber super and uh, human human mind they have a mind of their own etc you know the stuff that you see on film or actually stuff that is occurring now which is predicting uh, future crimes this is more than the minority report this is stuff that is happening now oh it's happening but then but 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 it's actually it's actually fantastic i mean if you can you can analyze someone's behavior patterns based upon a video mm -hmm. that's being played live and then an operator can be alerted to that yeah in an airport which prevents mass destruction Absolutely. as well yeah but then then there's then you have to look at um the thing that becomes problematic here is who's watching whom i mean the, you get into sort of this right. um um dialectic with you know surveillance surveillance society etc that we, we see in, a, in some countries uh, and and i think that uh mm. i mean for example it is no surprise that uh china and the russian federation basically have gone out to say the country that control uh that uh, is you know controls artificial uh, intelligence or uh, has as um, you know, uh, led in artificial intelligence will rule the world, and so you know you have to look at what what that means, and that that already is a statement at a, a state or a political level. So here you can get into, you know, surveillance. You can get into, and we don't have to look far back in history. I always give this example. I always give this example of abuse. We don't have to look far back back in history when you had Nazi Germany and the SS working with what was part of IPM, the Hollerath, Hollerath populator to take a census, you know, the punch cards. And um, they knew exactly where to pick up people based on their ethnicity, their religion, and so on. And this was technology, um, very targeted technology that was used. And so we have to, that's why I said we don't have to look far back in history because it it is looking at how governments who's watching whom so a governance model has to be kind of uh, in place here and when you democratize tools which is which is very powerful then we have to be careful of how um, citizens use these tools, tools in a responsible way for example if i don't like you is that spider in your spot uh, in your shower a spider or is it something is it a little very small drone with anthrax on it you know, these are the types right. of things that now we can sit back and say, well, you know, that's stuff of movies and stuff. But there is there's stuff there is thing there are things that we have to pay attention to. And we have to, as technologists, and this is my point, you have to actually declare yeah. the intentional use of that technology from the very beginning. Just as you could say a pack of cigarettes right. can cause cancer, uh, you can say this is the intentional use of technology. This is not to dissuade from research, no in no way. It's, no ways at all, but you have to say, this is how we intentionally use it. Anything that crosses line, we're not aware of, but you probably want to, to be careful, something to that effect. Right, I mean, I think it's very difficult though, when you, when you consider that the, you've got China who is, they've, they've invested a lot more money you know, than the US. So a lot of the mm -hmm. test cases around this is what I was reading the other day, have moved into mass production. So the US now need to catch up. I mean, I personally think that, 
they probably over invested a great deal. So they've, they would have wasted a lot of money because a lot of the things will be like, well, did we really need that anyway? You know, because it's like a lot of things like they would just make tech just for tech's sake. It's like, well, actually, does that actually help anyone? And, and you'll find that I, I think a lot of those cases will just have been a waste of the Chinese government's money. However, uh, what I do think is that the US is going to catch up. But the major issue that we face is, is, the, is the unconnectedness of China, Russia, US and anyone else in the world. And actually, they're not, they're not going to stand up and say, hey, yes, we'd love to be part of your organization that's AI for good or whatever, because they don't care. Yeah. And all they care about is 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 their continent and their country. And 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 I would love, I would love to 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 see it. And but I'm I'm not being negative about it. I'm just being kind of raising a, an well, important I, I point. Think, and I think. so with the geopolitics that is occurring, it's uh, it's very important to note that we have to think about what are the relevant political systems, what should they look like? We could talk about regulatory tech and what is the background that we should have. For example, I was in Dubai with a group of a hundred, over 200 spe- um, you know, specialists in this area talking about artificial intelligence and, and Dubai has a, as a, an, an AI minister. So, uh, and so I think, uh, I think okay. that's, you know, uh, that's very, very key to, to thinking about what are the, uh, what are the uh, what's the background that people should have, and what kinds of what does it look like for governments at at at, at level of governments? So, for example, when you elect an official, do you elect an official because they have an AI background or a cybersecurity background? You elect an official usually on on the platform they're running for. You know, I want my education or something to that effect. But I think what we're going to see is that uh, we're seeing more and more of the intersectionality between social science, political science, and computer science coming together as a discipline. And so you need to, because people, as as government, this is what we mean by regulatory tech, uh, government officials are going to need to have a a background in this space, and they're going to need to have a platform on issues around AI and its use, cybersecurity. Uh, is huge. I just uh, came out of a cybersecurity days in Switzerland, where I was a, a master of ceremonies, and I learned uh, a lot. Uh, you know, governments are looking at you know when your yeah. state attacked, you have minutes or seconds to respond. You don't know what the attribution of that attack is, and and that's that's very very disconcerting. Uh, and so you know that's looking at how do you train, how do you get uh, medium to small businesses to be secure. Do you have a certificate uh, for security in this space to say you're always uh, keeping yourself secure? And if you don't, uh, you have to pay a, a, a fine. These are the types of things that we're, we have to talk about in, a, in the society that we're, we're right. evolving to. And, and yeah, well, security massive. is massive, isn't it? Like, it underpins, underpins all technology. And that's the, that's the major thing. I mean, yeah, we've got this like digital ecosystem. People like to use yeah. this sort of term. I'm not that fan, fan of yeah. it personally, but it underpins all of it. Without, without security, I mean, it, it just becomes a threat, doesn't it? Waiting to happen, you know. It, well, it's... I mean, somebody walked us through, I mean, in the, in the, in just in the day of life, because it's all related machine learning and smart cities and internet of things and all of that pinging of information you you have to have cyber security and cyber defenses a, a part of that discussion so for example uh, here's a narrative you wake up one day nathaniel and uh, your mobile phone doesn't work and the street lights are going off and on and uh, you don't have any power uh, your energy uh, sources have uh, been attacked uh, the trains aren't working the the subways aren't working the tubes aren't working um and you the hospitals are 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 in dire shape you know you nobody can call anything that's what an attack can look like a massive attack the stock exchange is just going wiggly and uh who are you going to call because you can't call and so you know and what does defense look so so (laughs) this is sort of the massive a way it was looking that it can it can look and it's not to necessary skill scare citizens but it's for citizens to be very alert uh, you know about what are the yeah. policies that are going to be in place by governments by the military how are they training people 
just on basic uh, hygienics of, 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 of securing your platform and so on. So. It reminds me of a trip I took to Belize. Yeah. <laughs> I arrived in Belize. Seriously, it's hilarious. I arrived in Belize and um, yeah, I went to get married in Belize back in 2011 and arrived there and uh yeah there there were there were there was a competition for miss central america so all these women are walking around in like the skimpiest dresses and then and then we got we got out of the airport after we sort of talked to them and and and, and we went to the cash point and we tried to take some money out of the machine and there was no money yeah. so we walked around to the bank and then and then and then basically you know bump into some belizean that's like no man you can't get no money for you know, the phone <laughs> is off and all this, you know, and like they were on strike for three weeks. I kid you not. Yeah. Wow. So you could not get any money for three weeks. Yep. Fortunately, we bumped into like this lovely Christian lady and her daughter and we jumped on a boat to Key Corker, which is a fantastic little island off on the Caribbean. And and she she lent us the money and then someone gave us cash back on a on a on a on a visa card from a from a from a restaurant right to pay her back and then so we just hung out and relaxed but it's like that stuff can happen but then it it brings you back mm -hmm. to what we really are and that's humans We're humans. yeah and and this is forgotten in today's society i think completely i mean you have people who who just live for their Instagram likes, they they live for the Facebook uh, messages and and everything else, and they don't know how to have a conversation face to face in the real world. And it is we've lost touch with compassion and empathy in many ways, yep. and it's because I think we can't deal with our feelings. So, for an example, if you see someone on the street, a homeless person, and you you temporarily homeless person, let's say, yeah, because they are all temporarily homeless, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, as much as they're in that situation at the time, they could be helped out. But you but you see them there, and a lot of the time you just ignore them because you can't deal with the feeling that it gives you. It, yep. You don't to cope with with this dire kind of uh, compassion and, and and sympathy for someone that's kind of down on their luck and it's and it's really unfortunate but that is just a byproduct of society in general and our lack of caring these days i mean it, you know the churches used to used to treat homeless people better a hundred years ago than they do now yeah I, I totally well, agree. As society, because churches have kind of retreated within their own environments because they don't want to upset anyone. And we're, we're just obsessed with political correctness, you know, yeah. as well, which didn't help. <laughs> I mean, when, when, when was doing the right thing a wrong thing? I mean, um, the thing, uh, the, the point is that the human has to, in my, so all of this, the human should be in the loop because they have to interpret the data that's presented. So if you're going to push a button, you better know what you're doing, right? And so something has to put, because it could be, you know, algor I always talk about algorithmic decision making and, and human rights as an example. Um, okay. We have lost empathy. Well, first, that's one thing. Uh, the loss of empathy is, is, is something that I noted as a, a loss. We talk about a trust loss, but I'm also looking at an empathy loss. And I think that's okay. where we have to gravitate to what is social good, what is good to look like for humans. We have to have that empathy part of us. As far as education is concerned, we have become so dependent upon the tools that we have that I, there's a, a sticker that I have, Googling is not research. I remember talking to a chancellor of a university who said, I just want students to ask a question. If you cannot ask a question, if you cannot get into this discussion about right or wrong, and you're constantly having the phone at your, at your hand uh, and that you're so dependent upon it, you're not able to think anymore. And, and that depth of, of, of thought and discussion is so lost upon us. And uh, I will argue that we're, we're coming back to, to, to fill that deficit because that deficit of empathy, of listening, of posing questions, especially when we talk about ethics, we have to know, we have to understand, it's no, no surprise that philosophy is coming back in trend. As a, as a discipline, but we have to come back to, you know, the humanity, what makes us human. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, a, that's an important point that you have 
you know, articulated, Nathaniel, which I'm very, very, uh, you know, supportive of at the end of the day. Yeah. And, and the other part of this, uh, this, this, this discussion is if you have, going back to job and job curation, if robots are taking over your jobs and, and you were talking about nascent jobs as a service, then the discussion is ro should robots be taxed? Right. I mean, yes. Is, there, these are big discussions that are occurring because, after all, they took over your job, you know, and, and people were thrown out of work. And you, you got to give people, I mean, you have to be, give people the chance to upskill. And the other point I want to make going back to humanity is humanity and, and the work environment itself. We have become so toxic. Um, and, and this has, maybe it's tendentially related to technology, maybe it's not. But the whole idea of putting people out to work, I think uh, we have to be very, very careful about. I think that you could do some creative things like, for example, say, you know, Nathaniel, we have a deal for you. Um, we're going to give you a package. It's a different package uh, on certain conditions. You're not going to get a bonus, but you go away for two years and you'll work. Uh, maybe uh, um, maybe you'll teach in, in, in your village or your city, or maybe you, you do something that has a social good part of it. Uh, because we need teachers or whatever and this is but you still have the dignity of work you still have a, a salary and you're doing something good for society right and maybe after two years we'll revisit whether or not you want to continue or whether or not the group that you're working with wants you to to go further you right. know i think we need to be creative about how we treat people as as quote unquote resources uh, in, in companies and, and uh, rather than just numbers and, uh, you know, looking at what we're all called um, purposeful, purposeful, uh, you know, uh, innovation rather than just uh, looking at pleasing the stock exchange or something. You know, I think we have to be very, very careful for benefit companies versus, you know, uh, for revenue type of companies. I think you, I will argue that for benefit, you will get, you will probably earn more. There's a, uh, there's a, there's 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 a there's some arguments for that, and I think that uh, we're seeing that more and more in uh, in in empir empirical evidence that that suggests that that is true, that people are moving That's toward that. Yeah, I mean, the other day I was talking to talking to Dr. Churchill, Dr. Pano Churchill. Yeah. He's the founder of American Angels. I don't know if you know of him, but yeah. super interesting guy. I mean. He's been involved with over a thousand startups and he's created tens of thousands of jobs with these startups because he's got a process of, you know, angel investment, mentoring, funding, you know, the whole works, right? And we had this long conversation and he's the first person to reiterate what my, what, what you will agree with, I know, but it is, it is, okay, so let's look at the world and let's look at consumerization and consumerization if that dies through the use of ai and the reduction of jobs and companies making money without this social good element right without having having to contribute towards the society and the people who cannot work because they've been disrupted or they don't want to work yeah. right the entire wheel of consumerization dies so those companies in essence themselves die yep. right and, and he, you know, he's the first person to raise that with me. And I've been thinking about this for years, like since I sit, sat around this round table with, with IBM back in 2015, uh, with the editor of Wired and some really great people at IBM, uh, you know, uh, really high up people. And, and I was just kind of like, I was just sitting there and they were droning on and on and on, you know, like this chap from Wired. And I was just like, well, what you're saying really doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Like, you're just speaking for the sake of speaking. And, and this is the whole problem that I've got with, firstly, Google, right? If, if you want to research something, you talk to people. You talk to people and you listen to content from people who've either done what you want to do, know more about it than you're ever going to know because they've got 50 years experience, yep. yeah? Right? Instead of looking at some result that Google has adjusted based upon an algorithm that is, in essence, gamed because seo people are great at seo yeah. and it's an algorithm it doesn't give you high quality information it gives you junk that is generally there for you to buy something because otherwise why would that piece of content be there in the first place that's true right i mean and i would go back even to uh we know uh, you know when founders of google said look you know do no evil well do no evil is the hippocratic oath at the end of the day i mean it's it's really about that 
I, 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 I think uh, we, we have uh, had a strange dependency on these tools to, and we're, we're lacking the, the conversation, the agoras going back and forth and, and having these conversations in depth. And yeah, I mean, the thing about, uh, the thing about cons loss of consumerism, the hypothetical that was put to us actually was a very strange one in, when we were all in Dubai. And that is, imagine 20 years from now that the world has 50% unemployment. What do you do? 50% uh, unemployment. It was very interesting because the Chinese professor next to me said, well, that's a great thing. They don't have to work. The lady who is a nuclear physicist from Kinshasa said, well, that's a concern for us because uh, if, if, the, if the developed world, and that was her view, you know, what, is, what constitutes developed and developing world is... 50% unemployment, then we're going to have a terrible effect in Africa. Africa has 54 countries, right? And so uh, she saw it as, as very dystopian. Uh, mm -hmm. One uh, lawyer fundamentally said, uh, I guess that is it, that will probably beg, uh, more, beg the, uh, the policy towards assisted death, which is extremely dystopian. And the other one was more like, uh, well, let's make sure we colonize Mars very quickly. And, and the right. person who, um, who was actually uh, chairing that, his name is Callum Chase. Callum is an author of the book, The Economic S uh, Singularity. And basically what he was talking about is AI and the death of, death of capitalism. So he had an assumption that econ economy as we know it and the measures of economy would be breaking. Could you, would that mean if there was 50% unemployment that you'd have to reduce the cost of living? You'd have to reduce, all, you'd, you'd have to have sort of this, a different measure of economics. And so uh, the economic economists in the room were very uncomfortable with that discussion. And so, oh, yeah. but, but it's something that we need to think about because the thesis here is that you know, institutions as we know it are, are, are creaking and breaking. And, yeah. and so um, it's, and then we need moonshots. And I, I don't think to your points that you've made uh, earlier, uh, we should be asking for those moonshots, right? You know, could we yeah. imagine zero unemployment? Could we imagine with these technologies? Could we imagine dignity of work with these technologies? Could we imagine not having a governance model around uses, usage, responsible usage of these technologies? Who's who's watching whom, et cetera? And how do agreements? You're you, you're spot on about one thing. I don't imagine states coming to the table and saying we're going to you know like nuclear pro pro proliferation or or, or reduction. We're going to use these technologies in a responsible way because nobody will agree on what responsible way is. Very much so. But also, let's let's step back a mm -hmm. minute, right, before we move on, because I know I want to get to a couple oh, of other yes, topics. Oh, yes, please. Yes. We could do that in 10 sure. minutes. We've got plenty of time. No so what I was thinking was, what about the definition of work itself, mm -hmm. right? And actually... Because I was talking to someone, I had a thread on my Facebook the other day, and 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 I and I, you know, I was talking about unemployment and how, like, I think it's at an all-time low in the UK and blah 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 and everything else. But so what? There are still X amount of people who are not working, and he actually raised a good point. It's like, well, why do people have to work? And it's like, well, actually, you don't have to work, but you have to enjoy doing what you're doing. Yeah, if if. If you if you can make money and you can still enjoy what you're doing, yeah, then the definition of the word work is completely wrong anyway, because actually it isn't work, it's enjoyment. And when you find that enjoyment in your life, yeah, you should get paid for it, right? I'm talking to you, yeah, and I'm building a, 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 a few different different things and I'm getting paid for yes. something that I love to do, right? I love to talk to people, I love to, to reach out to them on social media, and I love to use social media. So, so then it redefines, firstly, social media platforms. I mean, there's a new blockchain-powered social platform coming, which is, which is gonna give 50% of the revenue from ads to the people who are posting the ads. You're in full control of your data, so you don't have to share anything if you don't want to, right? And those sorts of things are going to destroy yeah, a lot of revenue that's going into Facebook and everything else. However, it still, it still disturbs me that people could think, why do they have to work? And I think the word work is wrong. Yeah, I, think, <laughs> I know. I agree. Um, so so uh, 
you've just burned another topic here. You should enjoy, first and foremost, you have to enjoy waking up in the morning and doing something that is of value to you, right? So what I'm talking, I think what we're all talking about is how, how we can bring all of this stuff that brings value to you and not you bringing value to something else, right? And, you're, and, and there is some kind of compensation model. You wake up, you're excited, you're compensated for it because we live in a society that says, you know, you do have to pay your rent and everything else, but you, you're, you're compensated for it because you're doing what you're doing and you enjoy it. Now, it's a, a very interesting, you know, Nathaniel, what came out of also in Dubai as a study on well-being and policy, you know, what they're finding out is people are burning out because yeah. of the toxic environment in so-called work structures. And yeah. so, you know, having policy and well-being, uh, having policies that set about well-being is very important because, uh, and, and that gets to the point of, I want to wake up in the morning, I, 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 I'm excited about this. I'm not uh, nervous about, you know, am I on the layoff list or whatever list? I'm excited. I'm enjoying the people I'm working with or I'm enjoying them. I'm doing what I love. Yeah. And I think we need to, I, ag I absolutely agree with you. We have to bring that back and, and back into the definition of quote unquote work where it's you, uh, value is brought to you um, and uh, value is brought to you and you're, and, uh, because of what you're bringing you know, counter value to, to society, but also that you're compensated for it and you enjoy it. Right. There should be sort right. of the enjoyment aspect of what it is we do. That's why we yeah. get into the health issues, you know, burnout, yeah. uh, overweight, yeah. uh, uh, stress, smoking, and you, you name it, diabetes and all of that kind of stuff because people yeah. are just so challenged uh, and yeah. they're so insecure. And this is about bringing safety in your mindset, you know, because you don't have to worry about that anymore. There's the bringing, removing that from, from the, to, from the equation. Totally agree. Yeah. And it, but, but it's, it, there's also another fundamental problem that we've got yep. with technology and with, and with people and, and it's actually over ambition. Yeah. And over ambition causes a lot of suicides. Yeah. Yep. You've, you've got all sorts of different problems. We've got, We've got over ambition, which is like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go and build the next PayPal or the next Cisco or whatever. It's like, look, you know, sort your brain out. The chances of you being able to do that, your chances are you're going to get run over by a bus five times or 20 times before you've even managed to build anything that's a tenth that size. That's the first ridiculous thought that we've got to get over. And there's nothing wrong with ambition. I'm really ambitious. Yeah, I am really ambitious. Right. But I'm also enjoying the journey. And the problem is, is that people want to build a business and they want to build a career and they don't enjoy the journey. And that is creating massive issues. We've got technology that was, we were promised, right? Shorter working days. We were promised a better life and more money. Where the hell is it, right? Like it, to, to do anything, right? You have to work. 10 times harder than you've ever had to work in your life. You've got to manage your time really effectively and you've got to be really good at what you do or you haven't got a hope in hell of getting anywhere. It's just like, it's an insane world. We, we, we need a new social contract. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we seriously need a new social. I, I, I you know, you're, you're, you're spot on. There's no such thing as 35 day work days or whatever. 35 hour week. Hour work. Yeah, I love the French. Hour. Yeah, yeah, but, but work. It. yeah, but the thing of it is, it's not really working. And I, I think that's what you're seeing now in terms of, the, it's a new social contract. All these technologies, um, you would think, yes, it should, people have this wrong assumption. I think it's an incorrect and inaccurate assumption that it's going to make your, you're going to have le a life of leisure. You're going to have all of this. But the fact of the matter is we're still in these enterprises. I say enterprises in the old world. Yeah. And uh, and I think uh, we need to, you know, wouldn't it be lovely to create a new kind of model? And I think that's the, the opportunity I, for us all. I also agree with you that this ambition, uh, blinded ambition about, you know, I'm going to be a billionaire by the age of 30 is ridiculous because with, <laughs> with it goes with it goes with with it goes. Uh, you know, I will squash you at any moment. You know, there's winners and losers, and they're my my argument is we don't have to speak in winners and losers language. The other thing is um, is that uh, the 
the, the people talk about fail fast. Well, you know, uh, fail fast is not forgiving for people who have uh, experience because they're judged harshly and it probably gets us into the next model and certainly not for women. And, and so I think that we need to, to, to think about fail fast can also be very, very uh, disconcerting when you're talking about systems that need to, you know, that, that are uh, critical infrastructure type systems. You don't right. want to just mess with that. No. So we, we need a new model and the new model is, is, is this new social contract. It's a new social yeah. contract. It's like bring humanity back to, to te technology. This is, this is around bring humanity back to society in a, in a, in a way. This is about not haves and have, this shouldn't be about haves and have nots. It certainly should not be about winners and losers. Yeah. This, I will argue we don't have to talk about a zero sum game in this new social contract that we. Well, I agree. And, and, and also, if you look at population growth by 2050, the whole, the whole population of the world will have completely changed. I was looking at some stats the other day. I think you'll find that Africa is going to be number one, yes. India is going to be number two. Mm -hmm. And China is going to be number three. So we're going to be subservient to these massive, massive economies, right? That's true. That, that, you know, everything's totally changing. It's totally changing. And I think it's actually quite exciting. The major issue I have is with, is with these massive life coaches that say you need to step out of your comfort zone. It's like, well, actually, if stepping out of your comfort zone is your comfort zone, go ahead, step out of your comfort zone. But stop encouraging other people to be scared and stressed and everything else in their lives because they don't need to do that to actually progress and do something they enjoy, right? Yeah. Like, I have major issues with that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, well, I, I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm I, stepping out of the comfort zone. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be scared about what it, I mean, you, you can be comfortable about what it is you are doing insofar as that comfort uh, is not reinforcing negative, what could be negative uh, it, within the society itself. And I think it's more about, you know, being able to challenge yourself. And if you're challenging, how, what does a challenge yourself look like, right? Uh, what does it mean to kind of step over the cliff and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to re, re maybe I want to reinvent myself in a new way. Uh, maybe I'm not comfortable with that. And, and, and sometimes that's, those are the, those are the types of dialogues I myself have been involved in. Right. Um, and so what happens is that people will sit there and say, well, you know, I don't know, I'm not getting a, this gets into mentorship and coaching overall. I mean, people think coaching is about finding you a job. That's not true. It's about you. No idea. I think it's reflecting you in yourself. Yeah. And I think we, we need to take some time to, to look at that and, and, and have those self reflections about, what do I need to, to do better that will be, you know, um, will be, uh, an, you know, an improvement for me and, and right. value for me. Um, I'm a person that believes that education is lifelong. I don't care. I'll probably be 99 years old if I live that long and just go on to the next year. I, I just believe it. You know, I just, That's so it. funny. <laughs> it's exactly. It's my mentality. Like my, yeah. dad, my dad's yeah. 85. Yeah. And, <laughs> He would love to meet you. He he went Aww. to MIT. Yeah, Lovely. he went to MIT. Yeah, there you go, MIT. Hey, MIT. There we go. <laughs> yeah, he graduated in 1952 or something in MIT, oh. and his That's... dad went to MIT as well. And you know, he is just like learning how to use his computer right now. And like, he's been listening to my podcast, and he and he, he he just gets it. Like, but it's. It's having an open mind, isn't it? And just sure. just continual learning. And the funny thing is, I was exactly going to finish this topic on that yeah. specific point. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, because we started out with uh, IT and, 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 and diversity, inclusion and, and, and all of that. Um, and then, of course, well, let me let me just address that the, the one issue around inclusion and then go into um, also into continuous learning. I think inclusion is, um, is, is, is a massively interesting discussion. Uh, I don't, I think that if we, the way I like to put inclusion, Nathaniel, is the following. If our companies and if our organizations don't reflect the society that we have, then something's wrong, right? If they don't reflect your customers. If they don't look like you, I had people say, well, um, you know, I remember walking in, when I was in private industry, walking into a meeting, and I was the last person and one late and the person who was a lead for the customer said, I was getting concerned because the people who were talking to me 
didn't look like me. Right. Wow. And, and so, and so you have to think for one minute, if you're building stuff, if you're looking, what, who's involved in those teams? How do they look? And I believe if we get this right, we don't need diversity officers or whatever because it would be just so automatic in, our, in, in the way our DNA o- operates. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, we, have, we are a diverse group of mindsets, a diverse group of people, whether by ethnicity, gender, et cetera. Now, in technology, unfortunately, we've been seeing a lot less in the field. In fact, if you look at, you can do the measures, if you can look at the top, 50 were top companies that are actually led by uh, female CEOs or, or people of color or whatever, you can see uh, a massive decline. You can see some decline here, which is a concern. Um, uh, if you look at, you know, uh, technologists and women in tech, I always say women in tech or people of color in tech or whatever, yeah. you can see some, uh, some, some concerns that are kind of uh, are red flags. I think there's, um, it all starts, this is a complex topic, but it all starts at the home. And it starts at the home with who does the dishes, who brings out the, the rubbish, rubbish, all of that. And I think that's the thing that uh, we have to look at is how are we as families actually uh, bringing up our children such that they have diverse mindsets, you know, uh, that they're not uh, relegated to duties that are typical uh, for boys or typical for girls. I think that's, that's a big, big topic area. And, and the very last thing is about education and training and, and so on. I think, I strongly believe, I'm finishing my third master's degree now. I strongly believe that education and training and upskilling is not a responsibility of some company or some organization or some uh, government. It's your responsibility. Yeah. It's really your responsibility. Uh, and yes, they can help with, with, with regard to uh, uh, funding, but in the end, it's your responsibility. And I believe that the thirst for knowledge should continue. I, should, I think we should always be posing questions. We should always be looking at how is this stuff affecting me? Uh, we should always be thinking about the what ifs. And uh, it doesn't matter what your age is in, in, in that. Uh, lifelong learning is, is, uh, you know, is, is something that I believe we should be uh, striving for at all times. Right. But I mean, with with the gender gap, yeah, yeah. you know, the most important thing oh. is, yeah, equality, no doubt about it. Right. But it's, mm-hmm. it's it's but it's with a business, it's bigger than that, isn't it? I mean, if you if you sort of look at demographics and you say, well, OK, so who are we going to serve? Like because every business serves someone, they serve yeah. a demographic. Yeah. So for an example, you might serve a really broad range of demographics all the way from, you know, very, very young, all the way through to, to, to very old. Okay. So, so at that point, and, and also female, male, transgender, what, you know, whatever, yeah, lesbian, gay, bisexual, whatever, it doesn't actually matter. Right. But mm-hmm. the point is, is that you're serving individuals within those specific demographics. Right. So, So that means that you have to have people that are on your team that are within those demographics. Otherwise, how do you know what you're doing? First of all, is is working. How do you know what you're doing is right? How do you get your messaging right? How do you get your product right? How do you get your relationships working? Because if I'm completely different to someone, it's very difficult for me to have a conversation with them. Like I, I seem to just... I talk to just people who are lifelong learners. I don't really have conversations with people that aren't like I talk to people who are enthusiastic and kind of not necessarily extrovert, but, but you know, they are outgoing in, in some, in some respect. They, we all seem to fit a very similar mold of a person, of an individual that, you know, likes big picture thinking, doesn't really like the details. You know, these are the kinds of personality th- sort of, I would say disorders that I have. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I, I, I think that, uh, I mean, you brought it on, but because I think people have to look at, you know, we tend to hire, I think it's a thing. We tend to tap in people who, who think like us. And I think that is just a, around cognitive bias and we have to be able, we're all infected. We have to be able to recognize it and respond to it. So, you know, that, that's a reality that we live with. We like that, you know, like minds. And that's also kind of a, kind of a, a, a 
a red light. We probably want to, you know, think about how do we get the big elephants in the room to ask the questions of uh, maybe I'm not in agreement, but we need to challenge one another. It's not, it's not comfortable. And I think that being uncomfortable is, is something uh, as organizations we should strive for. The other thing is um, I believe in servant leadership. You know, uh, servant leadership is lacking. I believe when I, uh, when I go through a door, I'm, I'm, I'll talk to the person who's collecting the rubbish or the person who's serving the table. I'm, I, I believe in that because, uh, you know, that's around servant leadership. It's not about who's at the board level or, or anything else. These are all human beings. And uh, a servant leader is very, I'll tell you, there was a Harvard study, I, I think, maybe around eight or nine years ago. And uh, this question, this is Harvard Business School, was a question I think was 90, worth 95% of, the, uh, of your grade. And uh, the uh, professor asked the question, there's a person every day at 4.15 when you leave the class, something to this effect, there's a person sweeping the hallway. What's the name of that individual? Wow. Well, he I'm said, saying, if you cannot, if you cannot name that individual, I have failed you. You know, and that's the point, right? Yeah. When we, we, we talk about all of uh, the sets of technology, but this is about servant leadership at the end of the day, which is what we need to bring something forward uh, more and more in, in our organizations. That it doesn't matter. It's, I'm not talking about a sweeping of holacracy, but I'm talking about you know, the person who, 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 who was, ser you know, serving you, but also uh, you need to be serving that individual. Right. In that way. Right. You, know, you honor that individual by, by asking questions about, you know, what, how are they doing? I mean, what is their name? Where are they coming from? They have a story. We talked about homeless people, but, you know, this is about that servant. Of course. Group. Yeah. I, I share the opinion of uh, uh, your exact opinion it, on that one. I, like, like literally, I will, I will talk, to, I'll talk to pretty much anyone, you know, and, and, and I take, I find it really important. It's so important. Yeah. Like to the point the other day. Yeah. So where I go to church, right. I go to church every Sunday and sometimes I'll go have a coffee with a few of the, few of the people afterwards. And there's, there's like this kind of, there's this lady who's like, you know care in the community yeah she's got she comes to church with like three teddy bears and puts yeah. them at the front next to her or you know and then and then like you know she's she's kind of off the wall i don't know what to talk yeah. to her about but then there's like um a lady that's a manager of of the front desk in a in a travel lodge you know real kind of you know normal people yeah like people that are you know great people yeah and what i found really quite interesting is is exactly what you're talking about. So there's a there's an accountant who runs an accounting business. Yeah, he owns an accountancy firm. Yeah, and he's always giving out the um, the service cards at the beginning. So 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 I was kind of like, so I thought I, I I was invited by the lady who's the travel lodge uh, receptionist. I really like her as a person. She's very clued up. She's really intelligent. She wants to do something different in her life. And she's open to learning. And it's just like, those are my people, people that just totally open mind. So I sat down with her. I sat down with this crazy woman who's got hairy legs and she's wearing shorts. <laughs> like, I hope she doesn't get a teddy bear. <laughs> all wrong, yeah? and, then, and, then, and then another guy who's, who's basically like, he's caring the community as well. Like he's been in yeah. mental health for 40 years, had electric shock treatment and everything oh my god so i sat down there with the and then one guy who's who's kind of bordering on he was homeless but he's sort of bordering on um i think he's into drugs still and stuff but he's quite a nice guy and and actually if he got away from the people he's hanging out with he'd be really successful yeah, yeah? so i sat there and i looked at her and I looked at him and then this accountant guy walked past me. Yeah. And he just, and I said, Oh, hi, how are you doing? And one of and the, the lady invited him to sit down and he just sort of looked at all of us like we were just trash. Yeah. Um, looked at me like I was a loser for sitting there talking to these people. And I was just like, and oh, I was just, and I was just, and I just thought to myself, I thought, do you know what? I don't want to talk to you anymore. Yeah, like I, I have no time for people like that. If you can't be human and you yes. can't, you know, talk to people and actually give a monkeys about them. Yeah. 
then gender gap is an irrelevance completely because it's nothing to do with gender. It's to do with humanistic values of what sits behind people as an individual, yeah? Whether you're male, female, transsexual, whatever, if you can't communicate with other people on their level, be genuinely interested in their lives, their opinions, and what their daily problems are in life, right? You know, it reminds me of NASA, okay? And that fantastic, mm-hmm. if you heard, you've heard the story, haven't you? I think we talked about it the other day. And so, so someone walked past the cleaner, and the, I think it was, a, I'm not sure if it was a male or female, I actually forget, but they walked past and, and, and said, so what do you do here? And, and this, this person said, well, I'm just putting a man on the moon, sir. Oh, right? Yeah. And it's like, and that's the whole point. Yep. Whether you're, whatever nationality, colour, gender, you need to be inside that business, completely attached to the mission of that business and the corporate social responsibility of yours and the business because those now are becoming harmonised entirely from what I've been learning. So. Yep. Yeah, you know, well it's said. fascinating. Isn't that great? It is. It's well said. Oh, wow. Thank this is good. We could go on forever. This is well, so- we've got to get to this next topic. I reckon we're, we're ready now for okay. IT and information management. What do you yeah. reckon? Okay, uh, that is do it. over to you, really, because, like, I, I, you know, I've never worked in a big business. You've been chief tech officer or tech officer at Cisco, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, tech is, like, ingrained in you. Yeah, like right. me, I'm kind of... I only started learning about tech about nine years ago when my friend Eric said to me, what are you doing, man? You need to learn how to use a computer properly, you know? And, 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 and ever since then, I sort of sent him messages and I was like, so after about a week of me trying to use this computer, which now I would just throw out the window and like drive over with a, <laughs> with a car, right? I said, so how do I do this? And he'd say, oh, this is what you do. And then like a week, you know, a day later, I'd send him a message. So how do I do that? And then he said, after the third message of me asking him, he said, uh, Google is your friend. Oh, no, no. <laughs> well, I mean, um, I, look, I, I always say I'm an accidental engineer and, you know, coming into this space, I think uh, because of the curiosity <clears throat> of technology and, and how, you know, I got into, uh, you know, chip, and stuff like that and in the late 80s um i think that uh you know tech working for a tech company because i've worked for a tech company so that's your point uh, to the point uh you know it brings in its different sets of of uh of dynamics and uh they're the you know the thing that tech companies are are very concerned about is how they're going they they do talk about you know um, zero sum games, winning and losing and, and competing and being one or third or four, one, two, thir- three in the marketplace. And, uh, you know, what worries tech companies and what certainly has been an issue, what had been an issue when I was at Cisco is the startup community. You know, who's going to eat your lunch very, very fast. <laughs> so, um, and I love, the, now I'm in a startup community, some, you know, pretty much so. So I have a deep appreciation and we have, and, and, it, it, a very interesting inclusion, diversity mindset, uh, et cetera. I think it's just so fun. But um, I think the thing of it is, is that it was always a dialectic between um, when do you uh, eat your old to grow your young? You know, I mean, when do you cannibalize your services? Uh, you know, if it's, if it's still working, why should we, we worry? You know, um, you know, when do we take new pivots in the industry? And, uh, what does that look like? And especially you have to have people still maintaining the business. Uh, but the the thing of it is, is as you're looking for new pivots, people think that's a cool factor and they want to gravitate toward that and they're not maintaining the business. And how do you award those people who are still maintaining the business? And so, um, but certainly we worried about, and I mean, this is typical of very established companies, even, even the ones that we've been talking about, Google, Facebook. Um, how do we I mean, how do you maintain that leadership? I mean, so startups, they're constantly looking at startups, you know, where is that? Because why is that the case? They're agile. They're going faster. They could uh, present a potential uh, competition for you. And what happens typically 
if there's a match, you, you typically acquire them. So you start eating them, right? And, and that, and you have to ask yourself, is that a good thing or, or what? Because there may be, you have to look at what is a cultural fit? You know, these are people or organizations that have been used to how they work with one another. And all of a sudden they have been sucked up by the Borg. And, um, and I have met quite a few people who said, you know, I can't wait to get out of this or, or whatever, being sucked up by the Borg. And so uh, this goes into a very hard discussion, which is what does culture look like in these organizations? What should it look like in these organizations that are very big organizations, 20, 30, 70,000, I mean, 100,000 people, over 100,000 people, if you're looking at IBM, what should that look like? And that is about, you know, you'll have pockets where people, what does feeling safe look like? How, is, how fast does fast look like? Could we think out of the, could we think and say, could we imagine, what does imagination look like about what our future could be and what our customer is going to look like? I was always um, contrarian. I would always say our customers today may not be our customers, but tomorrow, right? you know? And so uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's all of these dynamics and factors, but uh, is it fun? It can be very fun. Right. It can be very fun. Of course. But maintaining your existing infrastructure, your mm -hmm. IT infrastructure and the security of it, like that's the that's the basic. Right. Mm -hmm. And then and then, in, and then integrating other, you know, products, for example, is is kind of what you do as, a, as an innovator, as a as a as a board member. I mean, you have to move forwards, don't you? Otherwise, you're they're going to eat your lunch because. It's the natural evolution of business. I mean, it's been going on for hundreds of years. I mean, in the UK, you know, my mum's side of the family, they were, they were in a brewery. So we had, we had the eighth largest brewery in the UK back in like 1800 and something. But yeah. back then, a brewery would start, it would grow, it would buy pubs and then it would bake beer and then it would grow and then it would sell the business or it would buy another beer brewery and then it would mm -hmm. grow bigger. And that's generally kind of, what's been happening in IT, but like, as far as information management is concerned, that is underpinned by the security of the business, right? And, and, and it should be, shouldn't it? And, and um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say early, early in my career, I was, I was involved in doing network management. And I think what's funny is network management has now become cybersecurity, if you think about it. You know, and nobody wanted to be involved in network. And network management was always the last thing people cared about uh, in, 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 the, in the days. But uh, if you think about it, managing your infrastructure, uh, managing the security of your infrastructure should be table stakes. We'll stop. Should be table stakes because so much uh, is at risk. And by the way, when we're talking about cybersecurity, it shouldn't be, you know, some, it's just some group doing it in the company. It should be at the board level of responsibility. It has to be at the board level because when something uh, happens, when stuff hits the fan, as we say, right, in a nice way, we call that a very, very a big factor of, of loss of trust and somebody will fall on the sword and it's not that group in, in some, parked in some organization in a company. It's going to be at the head of right. the company and the, uh, the board members. Right. It has to but start at the top. Would you also say that to manage information yeah it's everybody's responsibility absolutely i was that was my next follow-up is that everybody cyber security network management is everybody's responsibility uh, when i was at cisco we had a very interesting program where they kind of gamified it it's like a jujitsu program right <laughs> you know and you would pass tests and you have a, a a purple lanyard you know like black belt and all of that yeah, yeah. and and that is because the whole program was it's everybody's responsibility in the company, yeah. not just, you know, everybody has to be responsible. And whether you, uh, you uh, gamify it and create certifications around it, that's fine, but it is everybody's responsibility. Right, right. So information management is basically everything to do with that business. Like, Without information, a business is, isn't a business, is it? I mean, because it could be that might be your ex entire business information. Well, then you get into something that's tendentially another topic, but, but uh, it's data. At the end of the day, yeah. it's data. It's 
we're in a data economy. We've been in a data economy. We have to look at how we democratize data where, you know, people are making money off of you and, and so on and so forth. So data is, it, it, you know, it, it depends on how you categorize information at the end of the day, but data is very, very valuable. And so uh, do I have data about my competitors? Do I have data about future marketplaces? Do I have data, et cetera? How am I managing data of my ecosystem of suppliers? Uh, this gets into breaches and then loss of trust, et cetera. And then it gets into a subject of, can we imagine something where we're decentralized or hybrid decentralized uh, uh, moving forward in the future rather than having everything centralized? Uh, that is data. So, Yeah, and then how that data is stored, if it's encrypted, what containers it's in. You know, I mean, it, there's so much innovation going on in this arena. Like, you really need a team of people to actually keep up just with the innovations of what's going on in, in uh, IT. You do, and you also need to make sure that people, uh, the consumer is aware of. It's very interesting. Like, uh, I think there was some study that came out that six percent of consumers feel that they're out of control, but seventy-three or seventy-four percent believe that they want to be in control. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, of, of the data, they don't want to be notified. They don't want stuff happening to them. They don't want to be notified by some loyalty program or some credit uh, uh, program or whatever group that says, we're sorry, we, uh, your data is has been exposed and call this number. Yeah. Uh, they do not like that. And I think that we need to be looking at how we hold it responsible. But, but I think it's very important to put the consumer, the citizen back in that center of that universe oh very yeah. much so but also connecting banks to that i mean like if yeah. your data like it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out yeah that if so say let's just have an example i just ordered my food thank thank god it arrived at quarter two because you were coming on on the hour so i was just like oh my food's arrived yeah but so i ordered from sainsbury's yeah yeah so they've got my credit card details right okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, so let's just let's just have a scenario that a business has got details, someone's card details, their address and everything else, yeah? And that data is breached, yeah? Okay. A the bank should be held responsible for ensuring that is not used and it should immediately be notified automatically, yeah? It's a no-brainer of a no-brainer. I, I agree, Nathaniel. I mean, it, it's like where does accountability lie? And sometimes you get the hot potato effect. Now, well, you didn't read the fine limit, the, the, the fine line of your agreement, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, no, I agree. I, I fully agree. I'm excited. I think that we've got a lot of potential ideas. We've this got a lot great. of opportunities. You know, if you think about all these amazing products that are being created, you know, as we speak, someone's probably got that idea of how that could actually work. Yeah, they're probably already doing it. They might have done it already. You know. I, yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to look at, you know, ownership of your data and where that's going, I'm going to be... Uh, all right. I'm actually going to be uh, uh, in CERN on March 11th and 12th. March 12th is 30 years of the World Wide Web celebration. Wow. And Sir Tim Berners-Lee is going to be there. And, and he's certainly concerned about the misuse of this, the, this technology. And he's looking at, you know, at MIT, he's looking at some, uh, something called Project Solid, where in the end you, you become the, – the, 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 the technology shouldn't be used for surveillance, but in the end, you can become the purveyor and ownership of your data, right? And how you selectively you do that. And I think that's, uh, that is kind of the promise of what we can do. That is the promise, I think, looking forward of how we become more responsible for our use rather than having dependency on central groups. But I do agree with you one thing with regard to banks and centralized uh, institutions that have access to our data, whether they're phone companies or so on. They have to be held accountable. Yeah. Um, and, and it could be something like, you know, um, dear Monique Morrow, we're so sorry we lost your trust. We're going to give you a rebate or something to that effect. But right now we still have arrogance of institutions that we have. Oh, to yeah. About. Oh, yeah. And that, that's going to be completely, they're going to be on their asses soon. Excuse my French. But yeah, I, no, I agree. They really are. And, and also it goes to phone companies as well. I totally agree because 
So let's just, I mean, I'm getting calls all the time from these numbers in London, yeah? And I just keep blocking them because I yeah. search and see if they've actually been, you know, if they're a spam number and whatever. But they change the number and then call you with a different number, right? Sure. And I should be able to just do one click and it should be able to block that entire organization, yeah? All right? I should not even have to answer the phone. I shouldn't even have to do anything at all. Yeah. And that should go for emails. You know, someone putting me on a list with some email that I don't want in. It should just blacklist them immediately from sending me anything. But thankfully I've got a really good web host who's a friend of mine and he's been running a web host for 20 something years. He built me my computer. I just got a new computer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 32 okay. gigabytes of ram and i'm just like Woo <laughs> no. but but it's like you should be able to definitely be be in control there and yeah you know but i can actually turn up my uh so on emails i can go into the server and i can actually turn up the severity of blocking emails so it's like from one to a hundred yep i think so I'm, I think I'm at like nine now, yeah? And all I need to do is turn that up to like 80 and then very few emails will even come through to me. And I, and I think I'm going to have to do that because I'm just getting a load of spam recently. And it's spam, yeah. Me. So, but also I can block specific countries from emailing me as well. Yep. And I love that feature. That's just, you know, it's just amazing to be able to do no, that. No, that's really, that's really cool. I mean, we, yeah. we need more of that because... We have email leakage. We have, um, and there there are security um, implications to that. I totally agree. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, my brother, he's been working for Cisco for years, and, and and he's kind of educated me a lot around security. But I can't thank you enough for your time. It's hey, been Nathaniel. It's been cool. <laughs> yeah, really cool. Really cool. Really cool. Uh, I I've enjoyed the conversation, and congratulations on on what you're doing with podcasting and. And getting, uh, you know, the information out there. I think it's so important, uh, the narratives out there. This has been a wonderful discussion. And we could have even a, a follow-up um, on several topics. So Fantastic. looking very forward. I'd like that very much. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe and wherever you prefer, share with your friends. And if you enjoyed the show, drop us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen.